new constitutional convention. A constitutional convention it would be an incredible thing because it requires a, a three quarters, I think, uh, vote of the Congress to call one. And that could be to review and change the Constitution of the United States. The Congress itself can change or add amendments to it, interpretations, but not. And, and it has the power to call the Constitutional Convention. So this author over here, look, look how it starts. We the people, you see it? Okay. Now, what, what's he saying? What, why does he think we have to have a Constitutional Convention? He says, because we should make amendments, nine proposed amendments. Now listen to the amendments he wants to do. Prohibit Congress from regulating activity that occurs only within one state. Notice states' rights. Okay. Secondly, require Congress to balance its budget. Three, prohibit administrative agencies and the unelected bureaucrats who staff them from creating federal law. You know who did that? Uh, the Obamacare. At the last moment, after the Obamacare had been passed, the, the office that put that together inserted in there that all agencies would have to re uh, 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 provide uh, abortifacients, things that cause abor abortion, and also uh, preventive of, of birth. They put that in there. That was not in the law as was passed by Congress. So this is what they're saying over here. And there are a couple of cases before the Constitution, before the, the, the Supreme Court now about that. Uh, yes. Allow two-thirds majority of the states to override the, U, the U.S. Supreme Court decision. Woo! That's a check on the Supreme Court too. So if two-thirds of the states said Roe versus Wade is out, okay, that's on abortion, and it would be out. Okay, uh, just give me, give state officials the power to sue in federal court when federal officials overstep their bounds. Can't do that now. So, okay, allow a two-thirds majority of the states to override the federal law or regulation. Those are big steps. That, that's not permitted now in the Constitution. But these people, from time to time, you hear people calling for a constitutional convention. Bring everybody together, the states, and then change the Constitution. Well, that's a big step. Right. One of the things that was foremost in the minds of, the mindset of the founders was the idea of the covenant. Now, I'm giving you papers on the covenant, okay? And in some of my notes, I took them from the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics. And the covenant basically is an engagement between individuals, representatives, tribes. A covenant as a relationship of identity rather than kinship. So it's not the blood relationship. A covenant makes us one. God made a covenant with Noah. Just recently we read about that in, in the daily readings at Mass. That's a covenant with all of creation. You're not bound by blood. It's a covenant with animals, with water, with fish, with human beings. It's God's covenant with his creation. And subsequent covenants took place with Abraham, okay? That covenant. And then with David, and throughout the whole of the Old Testament, that's all you hear talked about. All the prophets are saying, you have broken the covenant, you've kept the covenant, you haven't done it right, you're gonna get it right. You violated the covenant. The covenant rested on one thing, the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, our God is God alone. You have to worship him with all your heart, mind, and soul. And you've got to proclaim these things to your children. And then all of Hebrew law flowed out of that. All of the 316 rules and regulations, laws, that are related to that on how you have to live 
develop out of that. We come down to the New Testament and St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that the New Covenant consists principally in the Holy Spirit. Why is that? That's a big line, you know that? The New Covenant consists principally in the Holy Spirit. We say at the Mass every day, this is, the mind, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. Does that mean anything to people? You think in, in church? On Sunday, you think they get any, uh, any feeling for that? I don't think so. People don't have a gift for covenant. Unless you begin to get in the marriage ceremony because the marriage for a Catholic is not a contract it is a covenant indissoluble you enter into it it's there and you have to work out of it work work it out why is that why is that the New Testament consists in the Holy Spirit I'll let you take that one home. I'm not going to answer that. But this is what you have to learn. You see, this is where we have to go. To treat me, if, if, if you have a, an understanding of that, and you are presiding in a school, the principal in a school, you will have a sense of the Holy Spirit working out, working through all these kids, everybody there, even the ones who are getting out of line and this, that, and the other thing. You're constantly looking for the action of God's love in all of this to bring us together. The Holy Spirit is the indwelling love of God. The Holy Spirit is the indwelling love of God in you as a temple, you as a temple, and all of us as a temple. As God's presence was in, in the temple, represented by the Ark of the Covenant, so too the Holy Spirit who He who abides in me and I in him will have life. How do you abide? Well, the Holy Spirit is the one who is abiding in you. This is a, this is a concept that, that we do not bring forth in uh, Catholic adults or even in children. You have to start with children to understand that their physical identity is, is certainly a gift and, and stands for their dignity, but the ultimate dignity is the love of God that comes in, dwells in their heart, and is present to them in there. The major stuff. And it's the Holy Spirit that binds us together in the new covenant, which is Christ and his love. Covenant between God and man and formula of legal agreement formally entered into by two contracting parties. And by the way, this idea of covenant, which came not only from Israel, but all the way up through the Presbyterians with the Scottish Presbyterians who came to the United States, immigrated down into West Virginia and the Appalachians. And you hear the music of people playing uh, fiddles in, in Appalachia. It's almost the same as you get in Scotland. Almost the same. It's really interesting. But they came with a sense of covenant, which was more than contract. So you had the idea of covenant theology in Scotland, okay? Okay. And creation, God entered into his agreement with Adam, the federal, head, the federal head of the race, and promises descendants eternal life on condition of his obedience. Now, here's a very interesting Switch. Okay. So we're talking about covenant. Okay. What's that? What's that word mean? It's a Latin word for covenant. we 
get our word friends federal. Comes from covenant, Pedus, federal. You see what I mean about these, these early founders? Everything is going to get coming out of Latin. When you go to Washington, do you ever notice the big buildings? The, 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 the symbolic buildings are all classical Roman buildings. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's memorial. Washington Monument, the, the Supreme Court, the Capitol building, and many other buildings there all come out of a classical Latin kind of uh, uh, history. The second, at, with covenant, and we go on over here. So federal theologians on the second page I have. Covenant of theologians is a famous, okay? Absolute sovereignty of God. Man had no independent right against his maker. Unquestioning submission to divine command, which is duty. Perfect obedience bears no merit and guarantees no reward. Man only admitted to divine fellowship by voluntary condescension on God's part. Pure arbitrary act on the part of God, no foundation in nature, etc., etc. To colonistic theologians, High virtue is submission to God's will, covenant spelled out specifically what that will is. So Puritans who had made so much of uniformity gave covenant prominence, and they, they were holding everybody to that. These are all very interesting backgrounds for uh, understanding how covenant underlies our, history, our understanding of constitution and as Calvin did. So if you go through your stack that I gave you, and you're gonna get another piece of paper over here. And let me look here, let me just go. Okay. Now, what covenant presumes that everybody has the same belief in God. What do you do with covenant when not everybody believes the same about God. Some may be Jewish, some may be Christian, some may be Catholic, some may be con you know, congregationalists, some may be atheists. So what do you do? You did what they did on the Mayflower when they were coming over and before landing, putting foot on ground. They were going to have to have a, a, a some kind of a structure to help them be bonded together in society. And that's why here I gave you this so that we could read it and then I'm going to compare the elements of covenant to compact to contract to constitution. And you see how we got our constitution and what parts of the Constitution and Declaration really reflect the covenant mentality. And that's why Lincoln was so, so convinced that you could not secede from the Union. This was a covenant of these states. That was really the issue with Lincoln. The, the issue was not primarily slavery. It was that these states wanted to secede and start something, he said you can't do that. This is a covenant, indissoluble covenant. You pledge yourself to this, you stick to it. So let's just look at the Mayflower a minute, okay? September 6, 1620, the Mayflower, a sailing vessel of about 180 tons, started her memorable voyage from Plymouth, England. They came, uh, uh, by the way, uh, 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 the Mayflower left from Amsterdam in the Netherlands with the pilgrims, okay? They went to, to Plymouth, there was a big storm, they had to wait, and then they took off. About 100 pilgrims aboard, bound for Virginia to establish a private permanent colony in North America. Oh, oh. However, they got blown off that course and they went to Provincetown, Massachusetts on November the 11th. 41 of the passengers signed the famous Mayflower Compact as the boat lay at anchor in that Cape Cod Harbor. Now notice, they did not let anybody off that ship 
until they signed the contract because they were going to have to hold to a type of government which was going to give them justice, law, order, etc., etc. A small detail of pilgrims led by William Bradford assigned to select a place for permanent settlement landed at what is now Plymouth, Massachusetts on December the 21st. Can you imagine? In the wintertime. And here's the text of the compact. Notice, in the name of God, amen. They don't say which God, but they say God. We, whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread, dread sovereign Lord J King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and England, King and Defender of the Faith, etc., have undertaken for the glory of God the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia while they were in Massachusetts. Do by these presents, solemnly and mutually in presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civic body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue of the hereof, to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony into which we promise all due submission and obedience. That, that last line was the most important. They were going to pledge their submission and obedience to this contract, okay, this compact. And with this thereof, we have undertaken to subscribe our names in Cape Cod the 11th of November, the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Savior, King James of England, etc., etc. And then these are the people who signed it. All the people signed it. Now, why is this important? Because kept very good elements in a covenant, but they were already moving away from the covenant in God, although they say that there to accommodate these people on that boat who were not Christians and didn't want to have anything to do with religion. So they make it a compact. Now, if you look at the next page, you see this covenant elements? In every covenant, you have, it calls for an oath. In the name of God, calling on God as witness. What does it do? It creates a people. We, the undersigned. This is particular to Americans in a declaration of independence and a constitution. All who have signed belong to the community. There's unanimous agreement to form a people, a community, and to be bound by the majority in creating institutions. You still see that in the compact, okay? I'm talking about the elements of a covenant. You're going to see what's left in and what's left out for the compact and the constitution. Creates a government, institutions, the will of the majority, lays out common goals, values, and hopes. Underlying this is an egalitarian people. Latecomers can come in on an equal basis if they sign the covenant. And finally, it lays out common institutions. Now, go to the next page. We have we moved. We've kept elements of covenant. You move to combat, and then you end up with a contractual society. Well, what did they drop out? In the first one, you're calling on God. In a compact, there's no oath taken. All you promise is obedience to the laws. It doesn't require them to take an oath. The contract is just between two people or more, it doesn't constitute a people. Two, creates a people. A compact creates a people. 
The contract is merely to agree to terms of the contract. Three, shared values and common commitment. You still have shared values and common commitment with the compact. That's dropped from the contract. You don't have any common commitments. Creates a church. Compact creates a community. Contract does not. It lays out institutions for decision making, not in the contract and not in the and, and, and the con and compact. Parties, indissolubly bound, but remain morally independent. There's the, there's the how. This is the how. You do not have that in the compact, and it can be broken in a contract if you decide that the terms of the contract are not being met. And if one party fails, then it must be re-energized re and then reactivated, and parties can walk away. So, what does it mean to be a covenanting people? I give you some things here from the Old Testament, but there is one more thing uh, which I have forgotten, and we're gonna do it right from both the uh, Declaration of Independence and the Constitution to see what elements of a covenant they still kept, okay? They still kept in this. So we go to the Declaration first of all. They're going, to, they're going to do this to make them a people, okay? A new people. They want to recognize God in there at the, name, the basis of human nature. But they say that this is coming from the people who come together to have a bond which is indissoluble. These are all remnants of, of the, uh, the, the covenant theology. You, you're going to have to follow the laws that, that flow from that, but it's not complete yet until you get the establishment of the people which is in the Constitution. So you have to take both the Declaration of Independence with the first lines and the Constitution over here and that, those, that's where you find the major elements of, of the, um, of the, the, uh, uh, the American Constitution and, and the Republic. Okay, it creates a people, it creates a government, it lays out common goals, values, common institutions. These are the elements of the Constitution. Of, of, of a covenant that you find still in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So, what is it? It's meant to be a relational document. How uh, we are going to relate in civic life. How are we going to relate in civic life? It all comes from Jerusalem, all the way up. And the understanding of it. Basically, we just have a divine up here, kind of. But here, here, here's here's uh, the changes for the American uh, myth. Uh, this okay, let's do that. I would say these two remain linked, but God is up here, no longer linked. You're, 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 you're reducing this down to human reason, human nature, nature's laws, and also uh, indelible and inalienable rights which flow from the nature of the human person. So this is what is being treated in the government over here, in our Constitution and in the Declaration of Independence. While they still make reference to this, but for all intents and purposes, it it is principally in the Constitution is not essential. There's no mention of God in the Constitution. No mention. But you do have it still in the Declaration of Independence. And it was pre presumed by these Congregationalists who were up here in Massachusetts and the Episcopalians or the Church of England that was down from Virginia all the way down. That was principally. And then in, in between you had the Quakers. 
So you had all these people who were the, 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 the forerunners of the founders uh, of the, 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 uh, the Republic, and all of that was coming together in what they put down here together. So let's take that now and discuss a little bit more how do you see this related to your being a, pr a principal in a Catholic school? What, what's that do? How does that all come together? It's something that you enter into, uh, it's an activity you enter into to achieve something. The Eucharist, the Mass. Uh, well, the Eucharist, yes, that, that's the culmination. The Eucharist is the culmination. You bring those kids once a week to have Mass, don't you? I didn't do that. I didn't bring up the mess. Just to give them a sense of God in their life. Yeah, there's covenant. Covenant? Yeah, yeah that's covenant. That's, that's a covenant. That's right. Okay. I'm celebrating the Eucharist coming together to bring the people to church. This. In any organization, one of the most, I bet you if I asked you this question, you could probably re repeat it and, and recite it for me. Okay, thank you. Mission statement, yeah. Leader gets people to discuss the mission. You know that the mission statement flows from a vision, right? And the mission statement is a very short two or three sentences that describes what you want to achieve. What you want to achieve. So you come over there and actually out of the mission statement, in order to achieve what it says is going to destiny down here, this is what we're going, you have values, I'm repeating this over and over and over. I hope you all get it. I hope you all get it. You should be able to recite this and say, okay, let's look at this organization. What's the big, what's the mission statement? How's it rooted in the vision? What's it imply by way of what you value? Uh, what are you gonna do with, with the norms and behavior that are gonna take you there and the structures, the rules and regulations of the school and finally the symbols over here. That's very easy to do as a coach of a lacrosse team. You gotta know what the mission is over here. Okay? What kind of vision does it come out of? How do you perceive yourselves as a team? How do you perceive each kid over here? What are you gonna do with this by way of what you value? How do you value this, your behavior with each other, seeing each other, not this of trying to be a star unto yourself, but your, your collaboration. What, what do you value over here in your contribution over here? And then finally, how are you going to behave on that field and ultimately the symbol and the trophy that you get at the end? You see them talking about here. Yes? Would that include goals? Oh, the goals flow from it. The goal, mission, goals, and objectives. It's three levels. Three, three levels. Mission, <coughs> goals. Goals are general, general things you're trying to achieve. Objectives are specifications, how you're really gonna get there. Uh -huh. So, you have you have a school, you have this Catholic school, you're all there and you, you're put in charge of it and you try to develop a mission statement and the mission statement 
is almost a way of declaring your covenant with one another. A mission statement would be as something as just like the Declaration of Independence or the uh, preamble to the Constitution. And when everybody does that, and you have to keep going over and over in the, the statement, you use that mission to keep you understanding your consensus, how this thing is going to hold together for you. And new people come in, you introduce them to the mission. You hire them on the, ba on the basis of the mission. Do you understand our mission? This is what we want to do. We're creating a covenantal school here in which we understand our relationships, in which we understand that Jesus is at the center and the Holy Spirit is working all through us and creating the essence of the new covenant, which we all come together symbolically to celebrate at the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the symbol of the vision, the mission, values, everything. Everything comes together perfectly in the Eucharist. So the Eucharist becomes a symbol which contains all of this. You got that? Is this coming clear? This is very important because if you don't understand this, you're just going to have those kids coming in to the place where they're going to have mass and are talking all over the place and the teachers are talking all over the place and everything else. I don't know how it is in your school, but I, I, I've, I've, on several occasions I have said, when those kids come in, you should ask them to be perfectly silent. They're coming on holy ground over here. And what you have to do with them is create a sense of we're listening to what God wants of us. First of all, how much God loves us and because we're loved, what he wants of us. This is very, 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 very important. I'm, 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 I'm describing one of the greatest tensions that we have between a, a, a Catholic world a worldview and the American worldview, which is secular, okay? We're trying for a more perfect union over here. More laws. <laughs> We want a more perfect over union over here, which is in the love of God. The love of God is the essence of the covenant. God covenants with us. So we take this underlying concept of covenant, which was there from the beginning in the, in the Republic, and we have that fullness to bring from the point of view of our Catholic citizenship. Faithful citizens. Are you, do you see this connection that I'm trying to make here? This puzzle view? Is it too much of a jump? Ask your questions. You're all so quiet. I can't stand it. <clears throat> Does this make sense to you? What you would do as a, as, as a principal? Right here, right here, right here. You have mission state ministry. You know what it is? I don't know what it is, but I've read it before. You read it? It's in the handbook. Most people have it in the handbook. What does that mean? Unless you're there, or I know of organizations that give it out on the little card. Here, carry that. I did that when I was at the university. I had the statement. One of the, that, that, that was one of my proudest achievements at, at, at you but to get the entire university to be on a one paragraph mission statement about the Holy Spirit. Their slogan is meant for others. Made for others, and you would get a motto out of that. That's correct, made for others. You have one in your school? Yes. What is it? It's in the handbook. In the handbook, and then? I don't know at all. Uh, no, at all. That, uh, see, this is, this is, this is, uh, on the basis of that then, you gather your faculty and you have a retreat. Yeah. And you say, look, what do these words mean to me? How have I experienced it? What am I doing? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's on the basis of that, then you build the covenant. You covenant together. Then once you say that, 
you can say to each other, you know, we have very limited space in school. We're increasing in our enrollment. We're gonna to have to do something about the space. What is one of our goals? To review space distribution and how we're going to handle it. And how are you going to do that? Well, I'm going to ask every, an objective. I'm gonna ask every teacher to find what kind of space they need and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> constantly go back to this. We as Americans constantly have to go back to this, the Declaration and the preamble of the Constitution. If this falls apart, our Constitution, the way we are constituted, falls apart. That's why we have to be very careful to protect this document. And that's why it almost becomes a sacred document when you go to Washington and you go to see it opened up in a copy. There are several copies of it, but they have it opened up and it's enshrined in, in a big yeah. thing over here. It's not, it's not, uh, we do not have, for instance, the picture of George Washington as the one to be adored. No. <clears throat> what we take is the Constitution. That's, and this is of the people, by the people, for the people. In other places, you go down in Venezuela, you have Madero. Okay, he puts his picture all over the place. And that's not, that, 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 that just would not be tolerable. In the United States. When we make a decision to put a president's head on a piece of, on, 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 on some change, the, the, the Roosevelt dime, for instance, after he died, they made the Roosevelt dime. That, that, that wasn't dime there before. It used to be uh, Lady Liberty on that as well. And then we had the Indian head nickel. You, know, you see, the Indian, you never saw that. Now what they're doing is making the nickels uh, represent different states, which are very nice, and, and I think also the borders. But uh, to make those kind of decisions, that, that requires a congressional act. Make it. So we don't have anybody we're worshiping. We hold on to, we respect, we revere the Constitution, which is a development and not just somebody's head like the French Revolution determining that this is the way we want to live. So, you don't lead as an autocrat in a Catholic school. You lead as a disciple of Christ who is trying to bring the school together to form a more perfect union. To form a more perfect union. And the more perfect union comes by being rooted in God through Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. And that's why for us, the spirit, it, the, the new law consists principally in the spirit of God. But that means the new law consists principally in the indwelling love of God in all of us. So when we talk about forming a more perfect union in, in this country, we are saying the best way for us to make our contribution to this country as faithful citizens is to create a covenantal community, which is the school. And these kids, therefore, are going to grow up relating to each other because covenantal replies the quality, it implies the quality of the relationships. How are they relating? They certainly wouldn't be relating as that, that those two kids that I told you about, my niece. You remember that story? I don't remember. The one kid had the, 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 the candy bar, the other kid stole, grabbed it off him, it, it took a bite and then threw it off. And she pulled him over and she said, you have to apologize to him. And the kid says, why? No, 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 no. That's not the way we have in a faith-filled school. That may be the remnants of a culture which is falling apart, but certainly not tolerable here. We have to have norms and behaviors which reflect going towards a more perfect union. And that more perfect union is in Christ. So talk to me about this because I think this is foundational 
and it's one of those points of contrast between what we do as a Catholic community with Catholic boys and what we have by way of a secular government. How do we bring that attitude over there? In a Congress where the only way you can uh, uh, achieve something is by way of conflict between interest groups and shouting down and manipulation. Shouting down manipulation is not dialogue or discussion. We have to go beyond that. And therefore, why is it so difficult to get the common good? And it always is. It, it always is difficult to get a common good. It was all also with, with the dialogue and discussion and arguments in the Second Vatican Council. No different people. But if you constantly go back and say, where's the Holy Spirit leading, rather than just where's my head leading, then it makes a big, big difference. So what is a Catholic school? The Catholic school, you might say, is a place where we're seeking a more perfect union. And the way they relate, we relate to each other in God. And that the leadership in the school can form young people in such a way that they don't see the weekly celebration of the Eucharist as just another activity. We have to go in, we have to go in, this mass is so boring and I don't understand what's going on. And then the difficulty even for the presider to be able to give a homily, which is going to speak to kids from pre-K all the way up to eighth grade. I mean, it, it, that's, that is a challenge. How do you do that? So we're there, and the principal has to take, take into consideration his faculty and his staff. How are we forming a more perfect union here? Setting time aside for days of recollection or retreats. When you take the mission statement, which should be really solid, and everybody is constantly developing a deeper and deeper sense of what the words of the mission statement really mean and imply because it can't remain in the handbook. It's one time you go there and you work on it and you put it in there and they say, isn't that beautiful? Boom, they put it in there, close the book and it's over, no. And in developing the mission statement, you are respecting the church as the people of God because it comes from the people, for the people, by the people. It comes from them. They have voice, led by the Spirit, in relationship to the Gospel, and you are able to put that together and say, yeah, we, we, this is us, this is us, this constitutes us. This is the way we want to go. So my big point this morning was, we're over here, we are looking at the, all this history, look at this, look, we went through that, all this history, incredible. And as I say, you should be able to find nuggets in here that pique your, consci the, your consciousness and your curiosity, and you go online and say, I'd like to know a little bit more about that, you know. What happened in 1688? What was going on there? Why was the king beheaded? You know, how was this growing? Why were Catholics persecuted? Etc. Etc. You go through that. Or what good point did Hume actually make? His skepticism. He was very skeptical of the possibility of reason bringing. Reason going to hand their hand, 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 hand? Come on, give me a break. No, not going to do it. And yet, we
We celebrate faith and reason, don't we, as Catholics? What we know in faith doesn't have all the answers practicable uh, in practice over here. Let's use our reason. How does this go together? So there we are. Let's take a five minutes break again. Give you a five minute break. Then we'll come back and then we'll sort of clean up things, okay? Did you read, did you, have, you, have you read Abbas and Art? You read some of them? Okay. Have you read some of them? Did you read some of them? Okay, well, okay, well, well then we're, we're gonna start a little discussion about that. We'll do the introduction on that, okay?